Now it's my great honour to um, hand over to the only one who's in this meeting who isn't actually an APA member. Um, and that is um, the former Lord Mayor and the former member for Adelaide, Jane Lomax Smith. Um, I am, oh, you got your, um, uh, I'm now trying to unmute you, Jane. You might have to do that yourself. Um, I'm happy to give the floor across to you, Jane Lomax Smith. Thank you for doing this. Well, thank you so much, Shane. Firstly, I acknowledge that we, well, I meet on Ghana land. I think all of you do. And of course, the parklands are truly Ghana land. So it's an appropriate acknowledgement. Um, I have to also thank Shane because I've been in lots of these meetings and apart from my technical ineptitude and clumsiness and inability to make anything work, I don't think I've ever been guided through the process as well or dealt with someone who had the little quirks and the poles. I'm completely stunned and um, we're lucky to have you running it, Shane. Thank you. Um, I also noticed that in the invitation that went out, um, it said that I was the former this and the former that, which reminded me that like some of the people here, and I'm not casting any aspersions about your age, we've been watching the parklands for many years, some of us decades. And there's a German phrase I always like, uh, which is the devil doesn't know everything because he's the devil, but because he's been around a long time. And I think that many of us have been watching with horror decade after decade after decade, and it never really goes away. Whatever you do, whatever battle you win, you know that you haven't won the war. You've just won the right to have another go next time they come back. So whilst you might think that in the middle of this pandemic, the crows have gone away to lick their wounds and look at another development plan, I would actually suggest that they will return um, and they'll be asking for government handouts. They'll be asking for money. They call it a development package or a stimulus package. And we won't be free of this madness. One of the things that I do know is that the basic question you ask yourself in anything we do as a group campaigning to save the parklands against any lobbyist or developer or general um, uh, chancer looking for a bit of land is that the fights are always the same, the arguments are always the same. And one of the things that concerns me at the moment, and I think the parklands are under great threat, is that when there's a crisis, the dynamics and the politics change. So my view, and I've also campaigned about heritage buildings, during good economic times, when there's not a recession, buildings are at risk. Everybody wants to demolish everything, knock everything over, bare dirt, no value in heritage. But when times are bad in a recession or an economic downturn, developers' attention absolutely turns to the parklands. And that's because there's nothing that people like in bad times so much as free dirt. And as I've said so many times, it's not cheap land, it's priceless. So I think we need to be ever vigilant. And it's worth thinking about our core values. That's why I like the Venn diagram, because it actually allows you to respond to the demonization that is inevitable when you campaign against anything. Uh, the first time I thought about the campaign about you look at the money, it's always who has the most to gain and who has nothing to gain. We have nothing financial to gain. The developers always have something to gain. Um, I grew up in London and one of the shocks that I had when I came to Adelaide was how little open space there was. Now, Many of you who grew up in Adelaide think that it's a green and pleasant land with lots of parklands. And we have, you know, 770 hectares in the city. But if you go across the whole of the metropolitan area, the work that Chris Daniels has done shows that we only have 5.5%, I'll say that again, 5.5% of public open land. We have lots of private gardens. We have lots of private space. But in terms of equity and access, particularly around a city that's growing exponentially upwards, not outwards, where there are high rise buildings, free public land, free access to public land is so important. 
I was pretty amazed to see that this figure for London, which is where I came from, the east end of London, there were public parks everywhere, it's 47%. Now, it's almost unbelievable that a city with 12 million people has such a lot of parklands. But of course, the greater London area goes out to where I grew up, which is Epping Forest, on the edge of the East End. And all those royal parks, all the rivers and the canalways, and all the public parks are counted as public access. And that's actually quite a shocking figure. That's what makes our parklands even more precious. In fact, the first campaign I was ever aware of reading about um, as a child, even though I grew up in Clem Attlee's electorate, so you would have thought I'd be more interested in NHS, interesting now, important, I realise now. But at the time, I was fascinated by William Morris, and my other passion, apart from Parklands, of course, is heritage buildings. And he had fought a campaign in Epping Forest to save um, a 16th century building which the developers wanted to knock over. It was the Queen Elizabeth hunting lodge, actually built by um, uh, her father, not Queen Elizabeth. But he, he developed this little organisation called SPAD, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. And it had a profound impact on me because apparently it want, they wanted to demolish it because they wanted to build a pub there. Um, and they said it was a derelict old boring building. And actually those arguments still stand. And he was called awful names by the locals, um, much as APA is called names about preserving anything. And that attack on us is something that we should expect to increase. Because in bad economics, there are lots of things that happen to the public space. Uh, one of them, of course, apart, I've mentioned the free land, um, but also the planning becomes sloppy. People want to lean over backwards to have economic development. They want shovel-ready projects. Um, and so we have to really be ready for the relaxation of laws, just as our civil liberties are going to be eroded um, and have been eroded over the last decade. The, I think the adherence to planning laws uh, will be less stringent and developers will be lobbying, the public will be lobbying to have anything happen, anything, any development, any building. So the risks for APA during this pandemic, I think, have not got any less. And we really have to be ever vigilant. And the arguments will be the same. They'll always be the straw man where they attack the NIMBYs. Um, they'll always um, make up this story about the parklands being in need of activation, as if all the people who use it are not using it now. And they'll also be, be using those spurious arguments that we've all heard before, like at the swimming pool, about it having a smaller footprint, which is always creative accounting, because what normally happens with the smaller footprint argument for something is that they add up the potting shed and a couple of lean-tos and a little path, and they make that a smaller footprint. But the issue is that it's already beginning to happen. And one of the things that I've noticed about parklands is apart from the fact that it's in the old days, you know, last century, the proponents of development in the parklands were, you know, they're often decent people. They're mums and dads who love basketball or have a passion. They want to build something mad like a museum of childhood, like John Mart with a John Martin's pageant um, edifice and the, the, some kind of weird Christmas event inside, or they want to have a flora and fauna park with a giant koala you walk through, all sorts of mad ideas. They usually are not the big corporations. What's happening now is that we've moved into big corporations. So if you go into the Western parklands, there used to be a little cricket club that's now been turned over. And the way they get away with it is they always have a fig leaf of something decent. They love to say, this is for the poor, this is for the underprivileged, this is for Aboriginal players, this is for women. So they've named this, this monolithic sacker extension in the Western Parklands. I, I recommend you go there. It's opposite the New Royal Adelaide. Um, it is effectively a four-storey development. It is enormous. And it's not a sort of mum and dad and tea urn club. It is a huge corporate structure. So we have to watch out for the fig leaf, as I call it. It's always a good cause. And the crows, the good cause initially was, unless we build this building, we won't have women's sport. 
well, how long? You know, you only want to use women when it's handy. You only want to use any um, minority group when it's handy for the, for the big economic developments. So I think that we have to be really vigilant now um, because we know that there are people who want concert halls, another football stadium, soccer stadium. They want basketball stadium. There will be many, many um, good ideas that come up for economic development that we have to be firm about and say this is the parklands. And actually there are a lot of people in the city who have dirt and buildings that need redeveloping. For goodness sake, take over something where someone is making a, a, has a major financial issue and spend money buying someone else's dirt, not taking our free dirt. Because it's not cheap, as I keep saying, it's priceless. The other thing that we have to be vigilant about is the Adelaide City Council. And I have to say that they have not performed particularly well recently. One of the things I noticed was that they're getting better at spin. And the spin around the push polling kind of consultation is particularly shocking to me, particularly annoying that they excluded the APA submissions. And I think this idea that if you're part of a lobby group like APA, you're devalued, but you can be a member of the Crows or a property council subscriber and you're okay. I mean, this is really not what I expect of a democratic organisation. And I think APA have been quite right to say this is a disgrace, because I must say that having some, been someone who tried to respond to that comment, those comments and the consultation, the website was appalling. It didn't ask what you needed to be asked. Do you want this to happen? Do you support a, a corporate headquarters being built in the parklands? It was kind of all kind of oblique and slightly tenuous questioning that didn't actually get to the crux of it. So that the results were, I think, meaningless. However, what really shook me was that the council were even entertaining this project. And that's why I'm so impressed with the, whoever did it, I'm not sure on the executive, whoever was responsible for that um, series of interviews and questions to the candidates in Central Ward did a great job. And it makes it quite clear that there's only one candidate you should vote for. And it makes it quite clear that if you want somebody who can step above the hype and the push polling and the nonsense, then there's only one person that I would vote for. So I will not in ask you to engage in rampant politics because I can understand that some of you might not be of the campaigning sort. But I do think if you look at those questions and answers, you have, and you're a member of this association, you really need to think about this election which is happening as we speak. Um, it has the potential to tip the balance on council and hopefully engender a little more openness and respect for history because I think the current council don't perhaps know about history. They perhaps don't understand the parklands. Um, and I think that's always been a challenge. That's why I so admire the girl for the tangent, Keith Conlon, who never hectors and berates, but actually informs and instructs people in the history of the city and the history of the parklands. And I think that trying to engage people and explain the problems is, is one hope fruitful task for the public and the councillors. But making sure that the right person gets elected, and you'll, if you've read those documents, you'll see that the only person who gives um, really reassuring comments is Greg Mackey. Um, is an important task. Now, I know that having looked at your photographs and names, there are at least two of you that have a vote in that ward. Um, and I would urge you to vote according to the advice of APA. And I'd also say for all those people who are not on the voting roll, it really wouldn't hurt for you to each of you find four or five people that are and encourage them to vote. Because the vote this time is really important. Um, it may just tip the balance. And we know that the Crows will be coming back. We know they'll be using the unsolicited bid process. And we know that if they're not in line, the basketball, the concert halls, the soccer, they'll all be wanting a bit of the action. And we have so little parklands. I think the barbarians are at the gates. 
They have their dozers fired up and they're coming for our parklands. And the more active we are in this election, the better protection we will have. So I think this is a really important moment. A lot of you are locked at home. You have your phones out. So please get, get working on this campaign. And remember that the process you've gone through for this by-election will be good in two years' time when all of their seats will be up. And I'd invite you to remember how they voted and make sure you campaign against those who don't protect the parklands because it really isn't cheap land. Uh, it's priceless. And you are the only people standing in front of the dozers. You and those you can um, uh, encourage. And I'm just so grateful you're there because you've done a great job over the last years. Um, there are many stalwarts I see across my gallery view. And you've been working for years. The issue is we never win the war. We just survive to fight again. But I have every confidence in you. Thank you.